And it certainly didn't sound like the SEC or, or the chair, Gary Gensler, changed their tone. Even after the approval of the Bitcoin ETF, there was a statement. Gary Gensler said he didn't endorse Bitcoin. Uh, he still called most other crypto assets securities. Is this posturing, or do you think there's a chance the SEC has changed its stance? There's an expression about, uh, you know, one of the definitions of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and not expecting a different outcome. I think Gary Gensler is doing the same thing over and over again, and it, it thinks that somehow he's going to win in court. He has continued to lose in court. Uh, I do think the chair of the SEC, Gary Gensler, has become a political liability in the United States. And I think he's not acting in the best interest of the citizenry. He's not acting in the best interest of the long-term growth of the economy. Uh, and it, it, I don't understand it. And I think at some point, you know, there will be a new chair of the SEC, and I think uh, that will be a good thing for the American people. Uh, there were a couple of interesting things after that Bitcoin ETF uh, was approved in that statement. One, and I paraphrase here, was effectively Gary, Gary Gensler saying, just because we allowed the Bitcoin ETF, don't think we're now going to allow a bunch of other crypto assets. The second interesting thing was the price of Ether skyrocketed immediately after on hopes that there could now next be an ETH ETF. Um, what are the chances of that? I think it's a certainty. I think this be year? Other, I, I, I'm not going to put a horizon on the time, but I think there will be other ETFs for sure. An XRP but, one? I, there will be other ETFs for sure. <laughs> but, but an XRP one? <laughs> <laughs> I love this game we play. <laughs> Look, uh, I am very... That's optimistic. the last time I lost. I lost. That's, that's fine. <laughs> but look, the sad part of that reality is we have a Bitcoin ETF only because a U.S. court said to the SEC, you're being arbitrary and capricious in your, applyment of, of your applica application of the law. What would be sad is if every ETF had to go through that same journey and for Gary Gensler to get smacked down by the U.S. court system again. That, that might, be, it might be necessary... But, it, you know, again, at some point, I think Gary Gensler won't be the chair of the SEC, and that will be a good thing for the American people. There's what the SEC does, and then there's what is going on in Washington uh, in, amongst lawmakers. And that's, those, are, those are linked, but also separate. Now, the U.S. hasn't passed any kind of comprehensive regulation around uh, crypto assets at this point. Unlike, you know, you see in the European Union with Mika and some of the other jurisdictions you mentioned Dubai, earlier yeah. as well, Dubai. Um, but there are a number of bills trying to make their way through the lawmaking process. One of those is around stable coins. There's a number of other, others as well. Um, do you think that in 2024 there is the political will, given it's an election year as well, to, to pass some of these bills and bring them into law? I, I said earlier I don't like to predict things based on time. And this one I will. I think this year... There will be uh, legislation that passes. I, I won't be as uh, you know, predictive about which one. I think likelihood is that the stable coin, uh, the, uh, clarity for stable coin. I can't remember the name of the bill that has been uh, you know, going through the, the system in Washington, D.C. But I think we will see that in part because the U.S. Treasury wants it. Right? I, mean, I think the stable coin market has really surprised people in some ways in terms of solving a real need. And I think it only makes sense for there to be regulatory clarity around that. I think that's good for the whole industry. And you know, one of the things we, you said earlier is, you know, are there skeletons in the closet? The stablecoin market, because there hasn't been clear rules of the road, uh, it'll be interesting as that, that comes to fruition. You know, the two primary, obviously, USDT and USDC, I think they are you know, here to stay. And I think you're going to see other entrants in that market, too. You, you said before that the, the U.S the U.S. risks losing some of the leadership around, around this industry, that other countries uh, have taken a lead, um, and a lot of that is due to what the SEC does and the fact there isn't clear regulation in the U.S. If the regulation does pass this year, if there's clearer rules for the, for the road uh, for, the, for the broader industry, does that help? Will, will the U.S. be able to compete with some of these other jurisdictions who took an early lead in, in this industry? I, for sure, yes. I, I don't think the, the market has passed the U.S. I think it has passing. And you are seeing, I mean, look, we have publicly shared uh, over 70% of Ripple's hiring last year was non-U.S., despite the fact that there's still a majority of our employees in the United States. Why would we want to hire in a market where we have a hostile government? We have a government who won't provide the clarity we have asked for, where we had to fight for years and spend well, uh, well over $100 million in the court system to fight them. So, you know, 
there will continue to be a lot of activity, I think, in London, in Dubai, in Singapore, in some of the other uh, you know, capital, uh, financial capitals of the world. But I think the US eventually figures it out. Uh, I don't know how to predict what's gonna happen in the election cycle, but no matter what, there's gonna be you know, a, a shift, if you will, and I, I think we will see a shift at the SEC, hopefully to a, a new chair that is uh, constructive and wants to work with the industry and not put their own agenda ahead of the, the American peoples. Um, I've been asking you this since 2020 because that's how long it's been going on for. Ripple versus the SEC lawsuit. When, when, when do we get a conclusion? Well, but most of it has been resolved, right? Yeah. So the SEC filed a lawsuit in December of 2020, so just over three years ago, against me, against Chris Larson, and against Ripple. The case against uh, Chris and Brad, myself, uh, have been dismissed entirely with prejudice, meaning they can't ever bring it back. And the case against Ripple, they lost on everything they cared about. I mean, their primary tenet was that XRP is a security. And in the Judge Torres's opinion, what she wrote is, XRP is, in and of itself, not a security. So I feel very good about that. The SEC then asked for approval to appeal that decision, and that was denied. So, I mean, look, the SEC has lost consistently in this case. Uh, there is a piece of the case that continues around institutional sales, because investment contracts, where Ripple sold XRP to in institutions who wanted to speculate. The irony there is, you know, again, the SEC's one of their missions is to protect investors. How many of our institutional XRP sales did they lose money? None. <laughs> so, like, what, what are we arguing about? What are we, like, anyway, so look, that will uh, proceed through the court system for a little bit longer, but I, I feel very good about where we are, and I, I, I frankly really pleased for the whole XRP ecosystem, and the whole crypto market benefited immensely from that legal win. Um, just for the last five minutes, Brad, let's talk about Ripple, what, what your uh, focus is this year, where, where you're going, and the future. Um, for, for 2024, where are you putting your energy? Well, a, a couple things come to mind there. Obviously, uh, our core product around Ripple Payments has continued to grow, uh, and that's something we'll continue to invest in, more uh, payout markets around the world. We, uh, through an acquisition, entered the custody market in 2023. Uh, certainly a lot of our investment, our incremental new investment in 2024 will be investing in the custody business. Uh, that, and is, that in, in, is that in anticipation of sort of some of these bigger investors getting in to the markets and... Well, I mean, I, on one hand, I would say yes. However, there's already a tremendous amount of demand. I mean, that business is growing very quickly. We announced publicly just a month or two ago that HSBC is a new uh, client of that business. So, you know, these are big accounts as well as more mid-market accounts. The custody business is very real and is going to continue to grow nicely. You know, I do think Ripple thinks about entering other vertical markets, so payments, custody. I think we'll do other things in 2024. Some of those will probably enter through acquisition. Uh, we've been super fortunate to have a very strong balance sheet at a time that uh, you know, the, the market has shifted and the, the valuations of a lot of these companies is not what it once was. That's been an opportunity for us, and so we're, we're going to continue to play offense. And, and what are the areas that interest you then? I was thinking about being your wardrobe consultant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm not going to announce the world, you know, the key areas, but look, Ripple at its core is a blockchain infrastructure company serving enterprises. We started with payments and financial institutions. We've moved into custody, a lot of overlap with those same financial institutions, uh, but we're going to expand with that same thematic of infrastructure, enterprise-based, uh, that served us well. And what, what are your uh, growth expectations this year? What, what revenue growth are you tracking this year? Will you be profitable this year? So, you know, we have been cash flow positive the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that has been a unique place in the market and allowed us to invest not only in the core of Ripple, but also in acquisitions. And even, you know, recently you may have read, we did a tender offer to our shareholders. Yeah. We've now repurchased uh, over a billion dollars of stock from our shareholders. Uh, that's something that's important to us. Quite frankly, because it is not an immediate term priority to go public. Uh, you know, in the United States, trying to go public with a very hostile regulator that has to approve your S1, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. You know, Coinbase obviously had their S1 approved and now the SEC is suing them for doing things that was outlined in their S1. Now, that, as I mentioned, there's a hearing tomorrow in the US about some of that, but I think it's indicative of uh, why would we want to subject ourselves to an SEC that is openly hostile to this industry? So, so in terms of an IPO, an exit of some sort, is that sort of parked to the side at this point? 
Yeah, I mean, or are you I don't looking elsewhere I, outside the U.S. for a listing? I, I mean, yes to all of those. Okay. Uh, I don't think about an IPO as an exit. I, I think about an IPO as a step in the journey. Uh, you know, shareholder liquidity is important to me. We have investors that first invested in Ripple in 2012. So uh, they've been in this deal for, you know, 11 and a half years. And so we want to provide that liquidity, which is one of the reasons why we've done these tender offers and now per repurchased just over a billion dollars of stock. Uh, you know, we have looked at other jurisdictions that have clearer rules of the road. But honestly, a lot of people go public because they need to raise capital. Yeah. Ripple's not really in a place where we need to raise capital. And so it, it is not a short-term priority. We're obviously keeping that option open, uh, and we'll evaluate it you know, as, as time continues. And we'll evaluate it again as we have uh, new regulators sitting at the United States SEC. And I guess some of it's market dependent as well. Last year was an interesting uh, you know, space with the, in the tech world more broadly. There were a lot of secondaries, buybacks but very few IPOs. The market wasn't obviously very great for them. So I guess it's also you know, how, how the broader markets play out as well. For sure, that's part of it. And it, you yeah. know, not just the public markets, but also the crypto markets. Yeah. And you know, I think uh, Coinbase's stock is in a much stronger position now than it was a year ago, but uh, obviously well off its highs from three years ago when it went public. So I, it's just not a huge priority. We have a lot of capital, very strong balance sheet. We can continue to play offense through an acquisition point of view, invest in the business. You know, as we started this conversation, I am very optimistic about the crypto market in 2024 uh, because of those things around putting compliance first, right. making sure we focused on solving real problems for customers and not just the speculative cycle. I think we'll put the whole industry on in a really good trajectory. How do you think the retail investor feels? Because the you know, we know in previous cycles, uh, more broadly, you know, you get the initial bump up, sort of at the phase we're in now. And what takes it really to those all-time highs is the, 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 the fever uh, amongst the retail investors. Now, the last cycle was, was special. It was a very different crypto winter to one that we had seen before, characterized by a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of contagion, and then obviously the issues with FTX uh, and Binance as well. Um, do you think the retail investor at this point may be a little bit more cautious this time around, this cycle, about dipping the toe back in? I, I think probably yes. But, you know, look, uh, one of the, I think, advantages, is I, I've been around the block once or twice. I remember the earliest days of the Internet as we know it. And, you know, the, the retail investor really drove the hype cycle of Internet 1.0. And I'm talking about 1999, 2000. And you know, then you had a washout in 2001, 2002, and that was a painful, you know, the dot-com crash. But today, when we sit here, the, some of the most valuable companies on the planet in Alphabet, Meta, you know, these are companies that were born of that era. And so I, I think that what happens in the short term around crypto is, you know, I, I take a very long view, and I, I encourage whether you're a retail investor or an institutional investor, I think if you take a long-term view about where these markets are going and why there's so much momentum despite the self-inflicted wounds. I mean, again, as you and I talked backstage, Bitcoin's not that far from its all-time high right now. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very optimistic about what we're going to see this year. Um, Brad, just as we wrap up, uh, I was walking down the promenade yesterday and crypto has been displaced by AI as the cool kid on the block. How do you feel about that? I'm thrilled. You're thrilled. Why? <laughs> Well, look, I, I think that the, it's good that crypto is boring now, right? Is I don't know. Like <laughs> look, I, I think uh, everything, every new technology goes through a hype cycle. I think AI is also a technology here to stay, transformational in a lot of ways, but also not exactly clear what the business models are, how it's going to play out. And I think that's where crypto was a few years ago. And I think now we're further along. And I think that's a very positive thing for the crypto industry. I'm excited about what's going on in AI. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a voyeur, not a participant in that world, but uh, it's going to be interesting. Brad, always a pleasure to speak to you. That was a whirlwind tour, as always. Thank you so much for joining me today. A round of applause for Brad Garlinghouse, CEO.